In the previous video, we have discussed about semiconductors, what it is, its properties, and how they are used in today's modern world. In this session, we will talk about our first semiconductor device, which is the diode. Hi, I'm Errol. Welcome to the Aero Electronics series, where we explore the world of electronics from the ground up. In this lesson, the learner will be able to explain the various features of semiconductor diodes, specifically its construction, meaning how it is made, its operating principle, meaning how does it work, next is its characteristics, how do we identify this particular semiconductor device is a diode or not, and lastly, its specification, what are the limits to its capabilities. Without further ado, start. To start our discussion about semiconductor diodes, let me first show you a scene from the Marvel Avengers Infinity War. And that scene will go live in 3, 2, 1. Okay, as you can see on that particular scene, okay, the Wakandan army now meets the forces of Thanos. So these are our protagonists, and this is our villains. Now they will be meeting for the first time on that particular area. Okay? And it is expected that when these two forces meet, there will actually be bloodshed, particularly on the middle of the battleground. It is expected that many of the soldiers from both sides will actually be dead on the middle of the battleground. Now, why did we discuss this? Why did we start our discussion with bloodshed? Okay? So, it is important to realize that the construction of a semiconductor diode is actually a combination of opposing forces or opposing materials. That is why it is actually called a diode because it is a combination of two electrodes and these electrodes are we have in this side a p-type semiconductor and on this side is an n-type semiconductor okay these two semiconductors each have their own characteristic if you can still remember on our previous video we have stated there that p-type semiconductors have holes as majority carriers well, n-type semiconductors have electrons as their majority carriers. So I will not be talking about minority carriers since when we combine these two semiconductor materials, bulk of the characteristics is dependent on the interaction between its majority carriers. Now again, what will happen when we combine these two materials? Okay. It is expected that since these two have opposing charges of majority carriers, here we have electrons as negative and here we have holes as positive, then opposite charges will attract. And when these opposite charges attract, just like in the middle of the battlefield where most of the soldiers die, most of these charges recombine with each other, meaning the holes will be filled up by electrons on the opposite side. And this process of recombination will put a region in the middle of our interconnection between the p-type and n-type that is void or depleted of holes and electrons. That is why we call this area the depletion region. Now, we have already discussed how holes in the p-type semiconductor will actually recombine with electrons in the n-type semiconductor, particularly when, the, when these two semiconductors are joined. Okay? And it is important to realize that when these two are joined, there is actually what we call a p-n junction. Okay? This junction, this junction over here, okay, as you look at the screen, so we call this our PN junction. 
And it is important to realize that this PN junction, understanding the concept of a PN junction, will actually be a good step or a good start to understanding other semiconductor devices. And that is why we started with diodes, because it is the simplest of all semiconductor devices. Now, what I forgot to tell you a while ago is that when these two devices or these two semiconductors are joined, okay, the initial reaction of the electrons in the n type will be to repel each other. Remember that the majority carriers in the n type region are actually electrons. So since they are all electrons, they will also be repelling each other. And part of those electrons that are repelled will cross our PN junction. And because of that crossing of the PN junction, when it meets a hole in the other side, then it will recombine. And again, it will lead to the creation of a depletion region upon attaining equilibrium. Now, let's talk about the term barrier potential. Okay? What do we mean when we say barrier potential? Now, as you can see here, this is our depletion region. Again, we likened it to the part of the battlefield where dead bodies are actually found. Or in this case, there is a depletion okay, of electrons and holes in this particular area. Now, it is important to realize that just like in a battle, okay, these soldiers that, has, that have fallen in the middle have actually loved ones who were left behind. So in connection to our P-type and N-type semiconductor, okay, the holes on the P-type, which actually cross the P-N junction and recombined with an electron, actually left behind okay, an atom that is now lacking a hole. So we call that atom now an ion. And that ion, since it lost a hole, will be a negative ion. Since holes are associated with positive charge, okay, then this particular atom will become a negative ion. Now, on the other side, we have an n-type serial. When an electron goes to the p-n junction and becomes part of the depletion region, that atom, that pentavalent atom, where that electron has left off, will produce a positive ion. In other words, these parts over here will have a surplus of negative ions. And this part over here will have a surplus of positive ions. Okay? And because of these opposite charged ions, okay, then we will be creating a barrier potential or in other words there will be voltage that will be created between these points of our diode now what is the purpose of the barrier potential actually this barrier potential that is why it's called a barrier because it serves as an insulating potential meaning there will be no flow of electrons and there will be no flow of holes if this barrier or this voltage is not exceeded. This can be likened to the forbidden energy band on the previous video, okay, wherein valence electrons cannot go to the conduction band. If this particular energy is not met, if the energy of the valence electron is not that high enough to be able to cross the forbidden energy band, same as with the electrons and holes in the PN junction. Since there is this depletion region, and within that depletion region, there is a barrier potential, then there will be no flow of electrons and holes, there will be no flow of current, therefore, this depletion region is an insulative part of our diode. Now, what we have discussed so far is a diode that has no power supply to it. In technical terms, this is called an unbiased diode. What if we connect a power supply to our diode, particularly a direct current 
power supply, just like a battery. What will happen to its characteristics? Let's find out. To understand the inner workings of our semiconductor diode when biased or when supplied by a battery, let us first understand that a battery is actually a storage device that converts chemical energy into electrical energy. And this particular storage device has actually a surplus or an excess of electrons in its negative terminal. Okay? So there is a negative terminal and there is this positive terminal. The negative terminal has an excess of electrons but it cannot cross directly internally within the battery because there is this particular separator. That is why it needs another path in order to reach the positive terminal since we know that opposite charges attract. Now, to be able to do that, it needs another path. Sometimes it will be a wire. Okay? And that is why if we interconnect our diode within that wire, then there will be a reaction because diodes, as we have discussed earlier, have electrons and holes internally. Okay? There are two conditions that needs to be met for a diode to be actually forward biased. And that is, the interconnection must be positive terminal to P-type, negative terminal to N-type, and at the same time, the biasing voltage or the voltage of our battery must exceed the barrier potential. Meaning, this diode has a particular barrier potential. If it is made of germanium, it is typically 0.3 volts. If it is made of silicon, it is 0.7 volts. And if it is made of gallium arsenide, then it is 1.3 volts. So those are typically the values of barrier potentials. And the battery that will be supplied to our diode must exceed that barrier potential in order to forward bias that diode. Again, the interconnections, P to P, N to N, and at the same time, the biasing voltage must exceed the barrier potential. Here is an example of a diode that is forward bias. As you can see here, the positive side of our biasing voltage is connected to our P-type semiconductor, and our negative terminal of the battery is connected to the N-type semiconductor. Okay? As you can see, since we discussed earlier that this battery, the negative terminal, has actually a surplus of electrons. And these electrons will actually push the electrons in our conductor. Okay? This battery will provide a pushing force in order for the electrons in the battery to repel these like charges or these same electrons. As it repels these electrons, let's look at what happens. Okay, so there is this movement when the surplus of electrons in this battery pushes the electrons in our conductor, it actually also pushes or repels the electrons in the N-type semiconductor, thereby giving it a push towards the depletion region. And since our biasing voltage is greater than our barrier potential, then it will enable the electrons in the N region to cross the P region. And this is what we will observe as we continue this video. So here we will take a closer look into the inner happenings or the inner working of our diode. So we have here our barrier potential and the depletion region. Again, the barrier potential can now be crossed since our biasing voltage is greater than its value. As you can see here, our electrons recombine with the holes to become a valence electron. And this valence electron will be attracted to the neighboring holes. That is why in the P region, there is actually a flow of electrons to the left, while there is also a flow of holes to the right. And after arriving at this junction over here, okay, to the conductor, the electrons in the conductor are actually pushed or repelled 
by the electrons coming from the P region to return to the positive end of our battery. In other words, for a forward bias diode, there is actually a flow of electrons. And consequently, there is a flow of current. Now, what about if we interchange the connection? The positive terminal of our battery will now be connected to the n-type semiconductor, while the negative end of our battery will now be connected to the p-type semiconductor. What will happen? Let's find out. We call this operation a reverse bias diode. Okay? It is a condition wherein the p-type semiconductor is actually connected to the negative end or negative terminal of our battery, while the n-type semiconductor is connected to the positive end of our battery. As we all know, opposite charges attract. Therefore, these negative electrons over here will actually be attracted to the positive end of our battery, while these holes over here will actually be attracted to the negative end of our battery. As such, there will be a widening of the depletion region as we will observe in this video. Here, the electrons are pulled towards the positive end of the battery. And these holes are actually pulled to the negative end of the battery. This is the widening of the depletion region. And this widening of the depletion region will actually make it more difficult for electrons and holes to cross this particular boundary. And as such, there will be no flow of current within our diode and there will be no flow of current across the whole circuit. And this is the characteristic of a reverse bias diode. In simple terms, you can think of a forward bias diode as a switch that is turned on. And you can think of a reverse bias diode as a switch which is turned off. That is why when you turn on the switch, there is a flow of current. But if you turn off the switch, then there is no flow of current. Diodes can actually do this automatically depending on the biasing voltage. Now we can also compare the operation of a diode to a check valve on board ships okay, as a mechanical representation of the inner working of a diode. For a check valve, it will only allow the flow of current of water in one direction. But when the flow of fluid is in the opposite direction, it will not allow it, as in this video. So as you can see here, we have this water, and it is in this particular direction. It is flowing in this particular direction, opening this valve over here. But notice that when the flow of water is coming from this direction, okay, this valve over here will not allow it. Okay, let's observe. And that is how check valves can also be compared to a diode. Now, shown here is the characteristic curve of a diode. Okay? In this characteristic curve, you can see that the vertical axis is actually represented by ID or the diode current. Or basically, it is the current that flows through our diode. And this one is our VD or the voltage across the diode. As we can see here, in the forward region, okay, at the start, there is no, there is seemingly no current, or if it has, it is very, very little, okay. But as we reach the knee voltage, which in this case is 0 0.7 volts, indicating that this particular diode that we are talking about here is a silicon diode, okay. 
when we arrive at the knee voltage of 0.7 volt, the current actually grows up rapidly, indicating that it is like a closed switch, which permits current to flow. Now, this is this forward region over here actually is associated with the forward biased condition of our diode. Now, let's take a look at this part over here, which is the reverse region, meaning this is associated with the reverse bias diode. As we can see, if a diode is reverse biased, it has actually a very minimal amount of current but as the voltage is actually increased in a negative sense or as the negative voltage increases and increases and increases it actually reaches a point okay we call this the breakdown voltage of our diode wherein if we reach that voltage the diode will actually conduct current so before we have discussed that in the reverse bias condition the diode will not conduct current but actually there is a certain point that the diode will conduct current and this certain point is when we reach the breakdown voltage for certain types of diodes this means that the diode will now be damaged and actually some types of diodes utilize this characteristic of a diode to create voltage regulators. Shown on the left is the schematic symbol of a diode, which is used to represent a diode in an electronic schematic diagram. Meaning, in an electronic schematic diagram, various electronic components are actually included. And to be able to distinguish a diode, this is its particular symbol, representing represented by a triangle and a line okay as you can see here so this is the schematic symbol this is the triangle and this is the line as you can see here we have the pn function or the pn a combination of the p type and the n type material meaning this p type material is represented by this triangle and we call this electrode the anode okay well the n type semiconductor is represented by this line okay and it is also known as the cathode shown on the right which is this one are the different casings or the different forms when we will buy or when we will look at diodes in a circuit board so we have rectifiers in DO-5 casing. We also have this type of diode, which is, okay, it has a slim line over here, or rectangular part over here. Same, same. And this TO-220A. These are the different forms of diodes that you will see. Shown here is the specification sheet or data sheet of a series of diodes. We have here from 1N4001 to 1N4007. And these series of diodes each have their own specifications. So a data sheet or specification sheet actually lists operational characteristics and parameters of our diode. Now what are these parameters so shown here are the most common types of parameters that are used so an example of an absolute maximum rating is what we call the VRRM or the peak repetitive reverse voltage okay. repetitive reverse voltage now for 1N4001 the peak reverse voltage is 50 volts if you can still remember in our discussion a while ago about diode characteristic curve, it is this voltage that what we call the breakdown voltage. Meaning at this particular voltage, if we bias the diode for negative 50 volts, 
the diode will actually conduct even if you connect it in a reverse bias manner. And the next specification is this one. This actually refers to the maximum average forward current or the current when our diode is actually in forward bias condition. This is the maximum current above which our diode will be damaged. So this is this has a value of 1 ampere. Let's go to the power dissipation. So the maximum power dissipation of this particular diode is rated at 3 watts. As we all know on your electro one, power is equal to current times voltage. Okay? P equals I times E. That's why we have a mnemonic pi. Okay? Now, if you take a look at here, if our maximum forward current is 1 ampere, then therefore, it will take 3 volts. Since 3 volts times 1 ampere will be equal to this 3 watts. Or in other words, our diode must not exceed this wattage value or else it will be damaged. The next specification that we will discuss is the VF or the forward voltage at 1 ampere. Okay? So basically, this is the barrier potential of the diode at this particular current. And it says here 1.1 volts. Then we have the reverse current. Again, the reverse current is the current when we reverse bias our diode. Now it says here that on an ambient temperature, ambient meaning at room temperature, that is 25 degrees Celsius, the value of our reverse current is actually 5 micro ampere. But if it is 100 degrees Celsius, increase in temperature, will also increase the, re the reverse current, which is now at 50 micro ampere. Now, this is very crucial, especially to sensitive circuits where a little deviation in current may be detrimental to the functioning of our circuit. And those are the common specifications of our semiconductor diode. Again, the maximum peak repetitive reverse voltage, or in other words, the breakdown voltage. Next is the forward current. Next is the forward voltage, the power dissipation, and the reverse current at different ambient temperatures. Again, this speaks about the limitations of our diode, meaning it must not exceed these particular values since if it exceeds these values, then it will be detrimental, may destroy or destruct our diode. And that ends our discussion for this session. If this video has been helpful, please leave it a thumbs up. Subscribe to this channel if you are not yet subscribed and ring the notification bell. You will be updated on our latest upload. And as always, I'll see you on the next one.